Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. We're going to be talking today about the outcome and implications of the French election with the chairman of the uh, Federal Trust, John Stevens, former MEP and um, longtime follower of French um, politics and uh, intellectual trends. John, thanks very much for, for being with us. Why do you think it was that Emmanuel Macron won and why did he win so convincingly? I think it was a, a factor um, based primarily on the economy and his management of the economy, that clearly there are great concerns about the impact of inflation, about the ongoing uh, challenges created by COVID and the rest. And it was a vote for competence in economic management against the adventurism that would have been entailed uh, been voting for Le Pen or uh, earlier for um, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. However, I think a very important subtext of that, which was to a degree linked and to a degree separate um, from concerns about the economy, was Macron's very powerful pitch uh, on Europe and on France's place in Europe. Now, to a degree, he was playing again on the high risk of having either Mélenchon or Le Pen, um, whose attitudes towards Europe, even though they've been uh, somewhat modified, particularly by Le Pen, who has moved away from being in favour of withdrawal from the EU and withdrawal from the Euro and the rest to, to a more mainstream position. But nevertheless, it would seem that she would have been devastating for France's position in Europe. And um, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the same, if from a slightly different ideological stance. So this, I think, was a vote for France's European commitment. And I think it was extraordinarily striking the way in which uh, President Macron celebrated his victory in the Champ de Mars with the hymn to joy, with his uh, arriving with a whole lot of young people around him, um, the extraordinary profusion of European flags, uh, something which I, I've not seen in previous uh, national elections in a major EU country. It was quite remarkable, wasn't it? And the contrast with the rather ragged singing of the Marseillaise going on at Marine Le Pen's headquarters was very striking indeed. That's, I think, the principal takeaway from this, is that uh, for a range of reasons, a sense of European identity that can transcend and support uh, national pride and identity uh, and support patriotism is not the enemy of patriotism, I think is a very powerful um, takeaway from, from this election result, as it is, of course, from the current Ukraine crisis more generally. How far I mean, do you think that, that played a role in, in getting Macron re-elected? Well, I think quite a lot. I mean, it's an in, some cynical commentators have suggested that uh, if it hadn't been for... Uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, the result could have been much closer. I'm not sure that's true, but it is certainly the case that uh, the Russian connections um, of uh, Zemmour uh, were a major element in the collapse of his vote ahead of the, uh, the first round. And I suppose you can argue that that helped Marine Le Pen. I mean, it, Without that collapse, it was possible to imagine that the uh, second round runoff would have been between uh, Macron and Mélenchon. Um, how important are the legislative elections going to be, in, in your view? What's the likely outcome of them? Will they act as any sort of constraint on Macron over the next five years? Well, there's been an awful lot of uh, noise uh, from both uh, the Le Pen side and the Mélenchon side, that this is the sort of third round of the elections and uh, uh, the presidential elections, and it would be possible to uh, constrain uh, President Macron's position by uh, depriving him of a majority in the National Assembly. But the opinion polls suggest that that is not really likely to be the case um, for a range of reasons. Um, principally, any form of unity um, on either side, either the um, 
rallying of Zamor supporters to uh, Le Pen's um, platform and some form of coherent presentation in the legislative elections from the far right, I think is very difficult to imagine. I mean, there is also a technical reason for that, that uh, the French funding law uh, does favour a multiplicity of parties participating in the first round because that's the basis on which they subsequently get um, finance from the state. And the same, of course, affects the, the left. The Mélenchon has got a better chance of creating a platform on the left than uh, Le Pen has on the right. Um, but again, I think the, the vote against um, Macron and uh, based on uh, concerns over the state of the economy, the cost of living and the rest, uh, that is not sensitive to uh, an examination of how realistic the policies offered to address that by either uh, Le Pen or Mélenchon. Let's um, talk of, of Macron tacking to the left or tacking to the right over the next five years, appointing a prime minister who comes more from the left or more from the right. Um, are these appropriate categories for talking about Macron? Isn't he um, the centrist, um, pour et simple? Well, he is. But I think what will be interesting to note is that I think the both the socialists and uh, the Republicans who were effectively marginalized completely in the, in the presidential elections, may well do better in these legislative elections um, than uh, the outcome of the presidential elections might have suggested. I mean, another element in, in, in elections for the Assemblée Nationale is the importance of local roots and, and local organization. And there, although the, the socialist and Republican vote has been uh, was uh, you know, humiliated in, in, in the presidential outcome. In the legislative elections, that those two main, formerly mainstream parties still have some strength. And I would, I think the thing to watch will be whether it is um, a, a socialist performance or a Republican revival that, that, that um, works out best. And in particular, whether the Republicans are able to uh, achieve more seats than, than Le Pen's grouping. Because um, at the moment, the, 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 the position of Le Pen in the, in, the, in the National Assembly is very weak. Mm. But, um, what do you think the, the implications in more detail will be um, for Europe of, of Macron's victory? He's been there five years. Uh, he's talked a, a lot about his desire to uh, accelerate European integration. Um, but there's been more talk than reality. Uh, is it going to be different over the next five years? Well, I think he is in an extraordinarily powerful position, potentially, as is France itself um, in the current situation. I mean, France has uh, now got a, a stable political position. I think it, it will have one after the legislative elections. Uh, whether that is slightly more to the left or slightly more to the right will depend on how these minor uh, the, the, the formerly mainstream but now minor parties perform, uh, which way he goes. Um, but in terms of France's overall position, I mean, it is an, uh, we have defence at the top of the agenda. It is a nuclear power. Uh, we have energy at the top of the agenda. France's uh, energy position, because of its, uh, its bet on nuclear power and the rest, is, is very powerful. Um, it is obviously absolutely central to... Um, the economic um, performance of, of the uh, EU uh, overall. Uh, so he is in a very, very powerful position to push through his agenda. There's absolutely no question about that. Um, but what is this agenda? Is it one of, in, of a new treaty or concentrating on the Eurozone, concentrating on defence? Well, the start is going to be dealing with the Ukraine crisis and uh, defence. And I think that there is a desire uh, in France, um, in, in, in the Macron's administration, uh, to see whether it is going to be possible to bring this war to an end. Um, and that the question is whether they can bring the United States and China into that 
picture. Um, I think this reflects also very much the desires of, of Germany, because there, there is a, a real sense that the longer this war goes on, uh, the more damaging it is for, for Europe's position. So I think there is going to be a renewed effort to try and see whether there is some possibility, um, either through Russian exhaustion or through um, pressure externally, um, to uh, come to some form of arrangement. And that will entail compromise, I think, uh, on the Ukrainian side too, probably. Um, but on the other hand, the powerful position that the EU has vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine in promising membership, in being able to extend uh, really serious economic support for reconstruction and things, I think does give it quite a lot of leverage. So that will be the top priority. But beyond that, I think it's, there is going to be uh, a tremendous effort on uh, the overall post-COVID recovery of uh, the EU and linked to that, obviously, the, 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 the energy agenda, which now has a strategic angle, but which behind that lies, of course, all the issues of, of climate change. And there, I think your, the French push will be for a much more integrated energy market, which will mean de facto that the role of nuclear power in the the overall EU energy mix will be greater than it would otherwise be. I think that the negotiating position of the Germans will be weaker. And beyond that, I think there is the question of the further development of the, of the euro and whether the uh, fact that the euro and the dollar area have been absolutely tied together in the sanctions against Russia, uh, the extent to which well, what the consequences of that will be overall for the euro's global status. But internally, there will be, I think, a readiness to finance um, both the post-COVID recovery and the energy um, transition uh, well, entailed um, through, through, greater, through greater European bonds. And so mm -hmm. I think the, 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 the crucial takeaway will be uh, a, a move, significant move towards a de facto fiscal integration. Mm. But will the Germans be willing to, to accept that? You, you talked about um, greater nuclear power, more reliance on nuclear power. Um, that obviously would be very unattractive to the Greens, who seem to be the most robust and active element in the present German coalition. Well, the um, Greens I think are... definitely about the Franco-German relationship in, in this more integrated Europe. Well, the, 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 the Greens' objection to nuclear power will be in Germany. But the point is that if you have a much more interconnected uh, European energy market, and I mean, at the moment there will be some focus obviously in, in providing alternative um, gas uh, interconnectivity and, and LNG and the rest, but uh, equally you know, a, a much more integrated European electricity market will mean that in effect um, Germany can rely on nuclear power that is not made in Germany, and so, um, and particularly in France, but I mean elsewhere too. And so I think in, in some respects, these green objections are going to be um, circumvented. Um, and, but against that will be a very significant increase in investment in a renewable energy. And there, German industry has a strong position. So that the thing, the, the, the interest can be balanced out here. It, it won't be it won't be clean ideologically, and there will be um, clearly uh, some tensions. But the chances now of creating uh, a a, real, a much more integrated European energy market and the industrial base that underpins that, I think, are uh, uh, very strong indeed. If the Ukraine war, it seems entirely possible, goes on indefinitely for months or perhaps even years. Do you, do you see that as being something that may fragment um, European unity? Because until now, I think it's been rather surprising, or possibly to Mr. Putin in particular, that, um, Germ that the European Union has hung together so well. Um, do you see the possibility of the economic um, outcome of, um, uh, of the Ukraine war continues to be to be a drag on um, on on growth, perhaps even well, leading. I, to I think there is real concern. There would be a fragmentation within the European attitudes. I think there is a real concern that this could could happen between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, and the question is whether the degree to which um, Western Europeans, France, Germany in particular, but also Italy, Spain, um, will 
really want to carry the cost of a major recession, which a prolongation of the war um, might entail. And they would argue that, in fact, what matters above all is that the Ukraine is preserved as a sovereign state. But whether that entails the current frontiers um, is quite a different matter. Um, the, the failure of Russia, I think, from the French point of view, it, what is essential is the preservation of, the, of Ukraine and its possibility of becoming eventually a, a full member state of the European Union. Um, but uh, the, the extent to which uh, the, that, the, that priority uh, matches the priority of the United States, um, that I think you is- You see that as a, as, a pot, uh, as a possible ground of, of dispute and, and tension? Between you, you, the European Union, perhaps not including the obviously not including the United Kingdom and America, that America may may be interested in a a sovereign Ukraine not within these present boundaries, but back within the boundaries that it had before. I think that is possible, uh, and I think also linked to that, of course, is that the 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 significance of the frontiers. Um, the current frontiers of Ukraine, or what 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 constitutes a sovereign Ukraine that that has seen off the Russian challenge, the perceptions of that are very different in, or significantly different in, in Eastern Europe than they are in Western Europe. I mean, the Polish or or um, Latvian or Lithuanian or Finnish view of this would be different than uh, from from that of France and Germany. I think that's where the, the, there is a potential danger in this. But uh, that does depend very much on, on this conflict continuing unresolved or indeed escalating um, in the coming months. And that remains a, an, an open question. The, the problem is that European intelligence, I mean, particularly German and French intelligence on Russia, has been greatly inferior to that of the United States and by extension, Britain. Um, and so I think that the, the, the chances of uh, an early end to the conflict that the Russians were going to get exhausted, that there might even be you know, regime change in, in Moscow, there's been much more optimism, misplaced optimism uh, in uh, France and in Germany. Uh, than, uh, and and that, that, I think, is a problem. Do you um, see any difference being made um, to Anglo-French relations, perhaps particularly in the context of the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, coming about because of Macron's re-election. Um, will he have a, a, a harsher, a more, a more determined view of in the enforcement of the Northern Ireland Protocol? Or, or wouldn't it make any difference anyway that um, Le Pen or anybody else would have had a, a very similar view? Um, sometimes the, the British press, particularly the Eurosceptic press, hope that uh, a change of regime in, in neighbouring countries will somehow make um, enormous difference to that country's relationships with, the, with um, the United Kingdom. It doesn't always work out that way, of course, but perhaps it is significant in this case. Well, I, I think the Ukraine war um, allowed the um, anti-European British press to uh, suppress quite effectively um, its deeper instinct, which was to hope for a Le Pen victory, which would shatter the EU. I don't um, think they did suppress it entirely, did they? They did not suppress it entirely, but it it, it was compelled to to uh, tone it down. I think if if there had not been that, it, it would have been quite a rather different story. Um, no, clearly, um, Macron's re-election is a victory for the EU and its principles. And I think there will be a determination, uh, depending on how the legislative elections turn out, um, but there will be a general determination to bed down a, this fundamental um, pro-European uh, majority uh, in France and more widely. And a key to, um, to that is to uh, ensure that Brexit is a failure. There's no question about that. And so <clears throat> that will tend to mean a much tougher line by France um, than might otherwise have been the case um, on key issues. I think the most important from a British point of view will be uh, attitudes towards the status of the city of London, and all the issues around clearing and trying to shift uh, Euro wholesale business from the London market into the 
into the EU. Uh, Macron's been the most dedicated opponent of the City of London and its current status in uh, Euro markets. And, uh, and therefore, one would expect that the indications that the 2025 deadline for moving clearing, for example, uh, will be a real deadline this time. And a large efforts will be made to, to ensure that that process um, is successful. I think it will also affect attitudes towards uh, any developments that we may see, I mean, it's too early to tell, um, coming towards a uh, push for, for unification in Ireland. I mean, how serious the Irish crisis um, could become uh, given the elections that we have um, up ahead and, and where they might lead. And beyond that, I think there is also, of course, a, a large historical background for this is the French um, uh, connection with Scotland and the sympathy that they might have towards um, Scotland being able to plausibly portray um, a fairly rapid entry into the EU as an independent country as a serious proposition, which is obviously a major factor in shaping uh, Scottish opinion, or could be a major factor in shaping Scottish opinion towards any eventual uh, future referendum on independence. Yes, that would be an ironic um, outcome, wouldn't it? Because uh, uh, certain people voted for the maintenance of the status quo in the last Scottish referendum um, under the uh, assurance that um, that would enable Scotland to remain within the European Union. Now, well, I think that is the major be... factor that has encouraged uh, a revival of Scottish nationalism. I think it that's that, now after after yeah. the, the referendum in two thousand. I mean, I think the, if it had not been for Brexit, we, the the Scot the twenty fourteen referendum would have been really the end of the issue. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the um, just as uh, it is Brexit that has revived um, the the whole border question in 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 Ireland, I mean, which was um, basically um, a sleeping a sleeping matter. Um, what do you think will be the, the overall legacy, last of all, in uh, Macron to French politics? What do you think is going to happen in five years' time? Do we need another Macron or, or will, he, will he need another Macron to continue his legacy or, or will um, French, French politics um, resume its more traditional course? Well, I think it, it, it will be easier to judge this um, after the legislative elections. But my own feeling is that what will happen is that there will be a return to um, a, a more traditional pattern of, of French politics. And I think the right will purge itself progressively of its anti-Europeanism. It won't purge itself of a lot of other stuff. Um, and of course, some of the uh, the tropes of the right, um, particularly hostility towards Islam and immigration and things, can be presented in a in a European way. I mean, there's, there's um, one could argue that that hostility towards Islam is one of the oldest European traditions. Um, one but could the, argue that one could argue uh, that I think it's yes, an argument. I, I mean, I'm it's saying it's that handled with prudence. The, the point is whether it's hostility towards the idea of European integration and the sense that Europe is. European integration is the enemy of national patriotism. I think that is what will be squeezed out of the right. Now, on the left, it's more complicated because th there is, I think, um, a, a serious reappraisal of uh, the liberal economic model, and that includes in trade and, and globalization and all the rest, which gives to um, any revival of the left, um, a, a, a more complicated, but also to a degree, a less anti-European tone. Mélenchon is a bit of an exception in that respect. So I, I would expect French politics to um, return to a more uh, traditional left-right um, divide. But my feeling is that the, the, the wind is behind the left in this, as it has been in, in Germany, um, as it may be elsewhere, partly because of the failure um, of globalization and the challenges that are presented to globalization now by the ideological divide um, with well, China ultimately, and also the um, tremendous complexities involved in addressing climate change. Um, mm. What you'd say reminds me of the remark of, D of Dan Quayle, 
that uh, he thought things would be would go back to the way they were before, only more so. <laughs> so um, that's what we've got to look forward to in five years' time. Um, thanks very much indeed. I thought it was a, a fascinating discussion. I hope our viewers enjoyed it, and I hope they'll look um, to see the other um, videos that we have in the Federal Trust, which are on a range of issues, but which are particularly strong on European issues. Thank you very much, John. Okay. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit, and about the future of the European Union uh, from the Federal Trust. Uh, I hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.